My task is to welcome you uh, to Trinity to this conference on biopolitics, society and performance. Uh, I've had a glance at your program. It is an astonishing program, really, exploring a very rich vein uh, in human society. The connection between biology and politics comes first, of course, and then the connection with society and the connection with art. And that connection extends uh, from the reasoning uh, of that kind which underpins the natural sciences uh, in which I have been working for the last, I discovered to my astonishment the other day, for the last 50 years. It's 50 years since I walked in the gates of this university as a student of science. But it extends from that kind of reasoning which underpins the natural sciences all the way through to the reasoning and the mechanics of art. Uh, just in passing, I mentioned that I just read a book on the conspiracy that uh, Shakespeare wrote, Shakespeare, a fascinating book by a friend of mine, uh, which argues that Bacon was the main author of Shakespeare. Some of you will be very familiar with this. I wasn't, but I was fascinated by the idea, and also fascinated by the idea that Francis Bacon, <laughs> to whom many people trace modern science, the reasoning behind modern science, the methods of modern science, uh, was also a person who believed that science was actually not going to be very effective in convincing people of anything at all and that we needed art to convince people of the, uh, the truths, if you like, which underlie uh, science. And I'm sure that that is true and I'll tell you something of my own personal experience in that regard. So my pre professional interest, I am a molecular geneticist. I've been working in genetic engineering since 1970, 71 to be more precise. The technology was invented by a series of uh, discoveries, came out of a series of discoveries. The last crucial one was in 1970, and in 1971 we were using these, uh, these techniques here in Trinity, which was, relatively speaking, early. And my first research project was entitled The Isolation of a Gene. And those of you who know a bit about genetics realize that the whole of genetic engineering involves isolating genes and moving them around from place to place. Not many people were trying to do that in those days, but we were here in Trinity. So I've lived with this. Uh, for the last 40-something years. It has revolutionized genetics. It has revolutionized all of biology. And uh, I don't need to say that because other people have. And for those of you who enjoy reading really good books, there's a lovely book published in 1998 uh, by Brian Appleyard. And in it, uh, the title of the book, by the way, is Brave New Worlds. And some of you obviously have read it. And it concerns our so-called genetic future. And he says, well, genetics is the most restless, turbulent, and demanding form of knowledge that our species has yet produced. We'll take that. I mean, goodness knows. In any case, it's clearly uh, changing an awful lot of things. And um, he might be right, because uh, I do feel that genetics goes to the heart of the matter. It goes. It is the fundamental science of life. It... Uh, bears on such enormous questions of what is a person and I might come back to that so it is of course particularly appropriate you should be meeting here in Trinity because in 1944 Erwin Schrodinger the great physicist gave a series of three lectures here in our physics theatre now called the Schrodinger Lecture Theatre on what is life and that was published as a little book in 1944 read by many physicists who then became geneticists and were crucial figures in uh, this revolution in genetics. In 1944, nobody cared about genetics, except plant breeders, by the way, and animal breeders, but otherwise, nobody had any interest in it. Nowadays, it's in your DNA, it's in your genes, it's entered into the lexicon of English, and I'm sure other languages as, as well. The Human Genome Sequence was published in 2003. 50 or 60 people have received Nobel Prizes in genetics uh, since 1970, I mean, it has had an astonishing impact on science and I think elsewhere. It's affected agriculture and medicine. It's affected forensic science. I'll say something about that. But what is the problem from my perspective? It's very simply this, that the, science, the public finds science very difficult, even repulsive. I came across that the other day in a debate where I lost. And I was quite clear that what I said quite repelled people. And I didn't mean that at all. Wolfgang Fruwald, some of you will know him, 
I think it was he who coined the term science anxiety. There is, in modern society, great anxiety about science. And I'll just give you some examples which are really affecting things in a serious way. The theory of evolution doesn't bother as much in Europe, but I can tell you it does if you don't know this. It does bother people in the United States. And the United States has, I think, about 50 or 60% of the people simply don't believe the theory of evolution. They're, they rank with Turkey uh, in the list of uh, people who have surveyed uh, as to their belief in evolution. And it has distorted U.S. politics in the most extraordinary way. You, some of you will be aware of this. It has distorted the Republican Party in the most serious way, along with the right to life debate and the abortion debate as well, and has caused a huge political divide in the United States. It's a more politically divided society than most people can remember because of a theory in biology, which is the fundamental theory of biology, about which biologists do not argue. So, extraordinary the abortion debate I've mentioned. Now, I don't want to trivialize that. I think the biggest and hardest ethical question in, in biology, certainly in genetics, is the question of when does a fertilized egg become a person? We know that an unfertilized egg is not a person. We know that a newborn baby is a person. But when does a fetus become a person? And you will, if you've thought about it, realize that there isn't an answer to it which means it's incredibly difficult to deal with ethically. Biological and genetical evidence actually plays no role, however, in the political discussions about abortion. We, that is, scientists, feel that our the scientific uh, questions here, our scientific contributions to this debate, have been minimal. There's a lot of arguments about cloning. Can we make a distinction between therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning? Therapeutic cloning is just medicine. That's all. Reproductive cloning, that's something different. Very, very problematical. It's not easy to make a really sound argument that ther reproductive cloning is absolutely wrong because if you were faced with a child who was born as a result of reproductive cloning, what is your attitude going to be? I've had this discussion with some of my scientific colleagues. I would treat the baby as a baby. They, for some reason or another, are just repelled by the idea that it might have been born by reproductive cloning. Very difficult. But I can imagine that there are strong, I would, I could advance them myself, there are strong social and political reasons why reproductive cloning should not be legal. I've lived with the whole debate about GM crops and GM food. This has been, frankly, quite an insane discussion internationally. The European, broadly speaking, the European attitude to GM food and GM crops can be compared to the attitude of the Catholic Church to Galileo. Crazy. Simply crazy. GM crops are as safe as non-GM crops. GM food is as safe as non-GM food. But you will find it. I know. I know many of you simply don't believe me. And you say, well, he's a geneticist. He's a genetic engineer. He would say that, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. But the scientific arguments are absolutely clear, and I'll say something about that in a second. Genetics and behavior, a very contentious subject. Large numbers of people have an inclination that genetics can have no influence on behavior. But ordinary genetics says genetics affects absolutely everything in biology to some degree. And the question is, to what degree? It's quite clear that in some cases there is a genetic predisposition to violent behavior. Is this something that we can deal with easily? I think it probably is. Because after all, if a person appears in court accused of some violent crime, claims, and there's maybe evidence that they have a genetic predisposition to violent behavior, the court knows how to deal with this. It's an old, old idea. It's called diminished responsibility. The question is establishing the, the, the point as to whether or not a person has diminished responsibility and why. So we have a whole series of, uh, as it were, flashpoints where genetics meets society. 
Uh, I've already mentioned in, outside over coffee an idea which I have tried to, uh, uh, tried to raise, not because I think it's going to be accepted, because I know it's not going to be accepted. And I know when I mention it to you here tonight, to this morning, excuse me, I know that almost everybody here is going to say that is wrong. And I'm a civil libertarian, let me tell you. I am a card-carrying me- member of civil liberties organizations. But I think in Ireland we should have a national DNA database, that everybody's DNA should be on it. And I believe that would enhance civil liberties. In the first instance, it would make certain that you don't convict people who are not guilty. And there's the Innocence Project. Look it up on the web if you haven't. Look it up. The Innocence Project. And find out how DNA testing has shown that large numbers of people, mostly black, in the United States, who have been convicted of capital crimes, and many of them on death row, were not, in fact, guilty because the DNA showed they weren't guilty. So the most important thing that DNA shows is that a person was not the person who raped such and such a person or was not the person whose blood is there and so on. And by the way, <coughs> it also, uh, I believe, serves uh, in, in effect what uh, a national DNA database would be to enhance the probability uh, say very significantly that a person is innocent. Now, from your point of view, this is where we in science need, uh, and that's a scientific proposition, but um, what we, of course, need is the support and interest, the critical support and critical interest by people with, I think, the general background from which you come, huge sensitivities about society and about ethics and about politics, which scientists fail to have, usually, in sufficient measure. How can you help to establish a circumstance in which something of that kind would be acceptable? So, I'll just mention something in passing then, uh, one other thing which occurs to me when I, occurred to me when I was thinking about your meeting, it concerns the nature of authority. <clears throat> now, in science we recognize authority. So I'm a geneticist. I know almost no physics. Recently I've become very interested in Newton's Principia and trying to figure out why, how did Newton figure out the law, uh, the, the inverse square law. This is the, the law that tells you uh, what the force is between the Earth and the Sun, gravity and such like. And I went and read Principia, and I read the paragraph, and I couldn't understand it. Well, that's not too surprising. I'm just a geneticist. So I then started corresponding with some of my physics friends, and they directed me to a wonderful book, which I recommend to you. It's called Feynman's Lost Theorem. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner at Caltech, where I was a PhD student and, uh, strangely enough, acted in a play, in a skit with him, where he played the bongo drums and I tried to play the guitar. Uh, it was great fun. But Feynman uh, actually decided to give a, a sort of a casual lecture to his first year physics class at Caltech and he decided to do the same thing, to try and figure out how, how Newton did this. And he couldn't understand what Newton wrote because Newton only wrote about that much. So Feynman reinvented it. And then a man called Goldstein got the tape of Feynman's lecture and tried to understand what Feynman had said and couldn't understand it. So Goldstein has now written down what Feynman thought he was trying to say. And uh, in any case, from my point of view, it's rather nice that that, um, even Feynman couldn't understand Newton. But the, the point I'm trying to make to you is this. If you're not a physicist, you have to rely on the authority of physicists in science. And I do rely on the authority of physicists. And the nature of that authority and what it comes from is a crucial matter within science. Likewise, I hope that when a physicist uh, wants to understand something in genetics, that he or she will rely to some extent on the collective authority of geneticists. Not my authority, by the way, but the collective authority of of geneticists. Now, the problem, of course, in the modern world is that over the last approximately two and a half centuries, authority has got an extremely bad name, and I'm very pleased that that kind of authority has lost its good name. 1900, most European countries were monarchies. They were entirely male-dominated, and also religion played a huge role in what people did. Now, thankfully, 
the monarchies are mostly gone or diminished greatly. Uh, we have had some liberation of women. There's still uh, a way to go, as we all know. And religion has a much, much less influence, much great less influ influence in society. I'm very pleased about all of those things. But at the same time, scientific authority should have grown in meaningfulness. But it hasn't. And it is said that one man's opinion about a scientific question is as good as another. That's not the case. So authority, uh, uh, in the sense that it stems from uh, collective uh, agreement about some serious questions is a matter of enormous importance within, within society, which is what I meant when I said GM food is say, as safe as non-GM food and GM crops are as safe as non-GM crops. That is a statement of immense, has immense authority behind it, uh, which I could detail for you if you would like. So broadly speaking, uh, my conclusion in all this and why I'm very pleased that the meeting is taking place and is taking place in Trinity is that science needs critical friends in the arts and in the humanities. So it was said of Brian Appleyard that he is an exception to the rule that good writers do not understand science and those who do understand science cannot write. So I imagine that Many of you, most of you, are exceptions to this rule. You're looking at this extraordinary interface, or series of interfaces between biology and politics and society and art. I hope that you'll have very fruitful discussions, that your work will lead to a better understanding of science in the wider world, and that scientists will learn new ways of promoting science with your help and the help of people like you in the wider world. Thank you very much.